as you know, in patients with normal kidney function, hyperkalemia is a distinctly unusual occurrence. But rather, where we start to see hyperkalemia is when we see settings where there is impaired kidney function. My name is Dr. Biff Palmer, and I'm a professor of internal medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. And I'm here to tell you about a paper that I just published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings entitled Potassium Binders for Hyperkalemia in Chronic Kidney Disease, Diet, Renin Angiotensin Aldosterone System Inhibitor Therapy, and Hemodialysis. What is our traditional therapies to treat hyperkalemia? Well, as I briefly review in this paper, traditionally we would look at patients' medications and encourage discontinuation of those medicines that might be offensive in, in impairing renal potassium secretion. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are one such example. Reflexively, most people would put people on a low potassium diet. Thirdly, we would augment diuretic therapy. Fourth, if the patient had acidemia, we would correct acidosis. And lastly, we would consider potassium binding therapy. As I mentioned in this paper, the only potassium binder that has been available for the last 50 years is sodium polystyrene sulfonate, or k -exalate. But what's been exciting is over the last couple of years, we've had two new potassium binding agents become available for chronic therapy. One is a drug called zirconium cyclosilicate. It's a crystalline structure that's highly specific for the potassium ion. And there are now prospective studies showing that this is a highly effective drug that uh, is useful in maintaining normal kalemia in patients previously uh, with refractory hyperkalemia. A second drug is called Petirmir. It's a polymer, again, highly affinity, uh, high affinity for potassium, and again, very good long-term data to show that this also is a, an effective way to treat patients who had hyperkalemia, particularly those who were receiving renin angiotensin system blockers. What I explore in this paper is what is the utility of these new potassium binding agents in certain situations. And I focus in on three examples. One is the maximization of renin angiotensin system blockade. Secondly, the potential of these drugs to allow us to liberalize the diet. And thirdly, what, uh, explore the role that these agents may have in maintenance dialysis patients where obviously hyperkalemia is a very frequent occurrence. With regards to their use in individuals who are taking ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or mineralocorticoid blockers, clearly these drugs allow people to remain on those drugs in situations where they might have otherwise been discontinued. As I think everyone is aware, remember in chronic kidney disease, these drugs have been shown effective in slowing the progression of chronic kidney disease. In patients with heart failure, the ACE, the ARBs, and mineralocorticoid antagonists have been shown to provide mortality benefit. So, the, so there's a great uh, deal of reason to try to maintain these drugs in these patient populations. But obviously in the past, sometimes we'd have to cut back on the dose or even discontinue those agents but what these uh, new potassium binding drugs have shown is that we can maintain normal kalemia with ongoing use of these agents, and this has a great deal of practical applicability. The second area I, I explore in this paper is the idea that in most patients who develop hyperkalemia, we always say restrict the foods like fruits and vegetables, which happen to be enriched in potassium. But remember that also somewhat creates a dilemma because the foods that are enriched in potassium tend to be those that are heart healthy. So we're actually restricting a very favorable or healthy diet for fear of getting hyperkalemia. And while these drugs have never specifically been studied for this purpose, one potential role for these agents could be to allow patients to ingest a more heart healthy diet, one that's enriched in fruits and vegetables. And should they develop hyperkalemia, one could potentially use these agents as a way to maintain normal kalemia and allow diet liberalization. As an aside, and particularly of importance, this also could lead to an improvement in the quality of life of these individuals so that uh, you wouldn't necessarily have to have such an intense diet restriction. The third area that I explore is the role that these drugs may provide in maintaining normal kalemia or preventing pre-dialysis hyperkalemia. Well, one 
observation that's made in the literature is that during the long interdialytic period, that period prior to the next dialysis is associated with a higher mortality. And there's at least a suggestion that that higher mortality may be related to large fluctuations in potassium. Imagine that somebody comes into the dialysis unit and has a high potassium, and you're using a bath potassium of two, there's a very large gradient and a rapid reduction in that first hour of therapy. And this could be problematic and potentially pro-arrhythmogenic. And so again, another potential utility of these potassium binding drugs is to prevent pre-dialysis hyperkalemia, allow even the dialysate bath to be raised to help minimize that initial gradient in the initial part of the therapy. So the precise role that these agents uh, have in the dialysis patient population is currently being explored, but again, uh, their effectiveness is going to be quite useful, I would predict. So again, I'm very excited, and I hope you read this article. I think it provides uh, a, a great deal of information about the utility of these new strategies to help maintain normal kalemia in patients uh, who have this particular problem. So thank you very much. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter more information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.